Good evening, Rowan. It's the 28th of August, 2016, and it's about 11.30. And obviously, I'm making you my usual Sunday evening video to reassure you I haven't been seducing any priests over the weekend, so you can relax. <laughs> anyway, I thought we could continue our little chat about your bizarre videos that you made about Narnia um, in January 2013, which was just after you'd left office as Archbishop of Canterbury at the end of 2012. Um, so I'm going to talk about two videos this evening. The first one I'm going to talk about in full, and it's entitled The Puppet Christ. Um, so you say, C.S. Lewis admired the writings of Thomas Merton, the American monk, and Merton, in one of his journals, comments that he's been reading a pious biography of some saint or bishop or other. Uh, so the first comment I'm going to make is that you've associated the concept of saint here with the concept of bishop. Um, and of course you're a bishop, but you're obviously not a saint because you're a Luciferian, you're not even a Christian. You're a psychopath and you're a sexual predator and an Illuminati shill. Uh, so there's no point using techniques like that uh, when we know all about you. <laughs> you're living in La La Land. <laughs> anyway, you said that uh, Thomas Merton, who isn't a saint by the way, had been reading a pious biography of some saint or bishop or other who had said, I never denied God a moment of my time. I hope he takes that into account. Uh, well, who knows if Thomas Merton even said this or the person he's supposed to be quoting even said it at all because you do make up a lot of crap. Uh, but anyway, you say, Merton's objecting to the idea that somehow God is in our debt. If we do the right things, God will do the right thing by us. Uh, well, the simple fact is that if we do the right things, God will do the right thing by us because that's what he promised. God's made a covenant with us. Uh, God doesn't change his mind. Um, God is eternal and unchanging. So if God makes a covenant, that's going to be what he wants through all eternity. He hasn't... Um, he doesn't make mistakes um, so he's made a covenant with us and if we do the right things then he will do the right thing by us um, and because we're unable to keep the law perfectly then he came in human flesh as Christ and died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead uh, so he defeated sin and death um, and so the new covenant is sealed in the blood of Christ um, so it's an eternal covenant. It's never going to end. So if we do the right things, then God will do the right thing by us because that's what he promised. And he can't change his mind. He can't act to God um, against his own nature. Um, so I don't know why you'd be putting some nonsense in like that, like God's all over the place and changing his mind every two minutes. Uh, you're probably thinking of yourself there. So you say, God becomes someone who obediently reflects our priorities and our agenda. Uh, well, that isn't really true, is it? Because we find out about God as Christians in scripture, in tradition, in Christian doctrine, in the creeds, in that kind of thing. So expecting God to act according to his nature um, isn't really expecting God <laughs> to obediently reflect our priorities, is it? or saying that he's somehow in our debt. Um, so you then say, and it's that notion of God as a kind of puppet, God as a great magnified image of me and of what I would like and what I would do. Uh, well, God is a great magnified image of you, isn't he, Rowan? That's God to you. You are God and you're greatly magnified in your own mind because of your extreme narcissism. You think you're superior to everybody else when really you're just a total crackpot and a nasty piece of work. Um, so God is a great magnified image of me and what I would like and what I would do. It's that sort of fiction that Lewis is also undermining in the Narnia stories. Oh, well, who knows if that's true anyway. 
So you then say he helps us to see just how often we expect God to be like us. We think, what would I do if I were God? If I were all powerful, if I were all knowing, I'd do this, that and the other. And I certainly wouldn't do this, that and the other. Well, I really don't know who is thinking these things. Maybe some teenagers having discussions in the evening or something like that. Maybe they would be talking about things like that. But adults have kind of moved on from that kind of thing, really. You know, it's a phase you go through and then you grow out of it. Um, unless you're chronically immature and your personality isn't formed like you, I suppose. Um, and then you just keep on dredging all this adolescent angst up all the time. And quite frankly, adolescent angst is very mature for you because really you're under five. Um, so you say, surely I wouldn't expose myself. Um, so exposing yourself um, means showing your genitals, doesn't it? So you say, surely I wouldn't expose myself to suffering, to risk. Surely I would make the full demands of justice and not think about mercy, or alternatively, surely I would be merciful in all possible circumstances and let people off everything and tell them that their actions and their decisions didn't really matter or didn't really have consequences. So Lewis is trying to wean us away from that picture of God that is simply a big magnified version of us doing what we would do. Uh, so I don't know what kind of people uh, would be simplifying the world and the people in it to this extent where you're either going to let everybody off everything um, or you're going to condemn everybody for everything i mean who's like that anyway even people aren't like that uh, so i don't know why anyone would be thinking that god was like that um, you're just making this up you're creating a problem that people have this spiritual problem where um everything's either at one extreme or the other this is something you do quite frequently um there's no real subtlety in your arguments you talk about nuances and things like that but in fact you hardly use nuance you paint in very uh, dramatic um extreme pictures where everything is either one way or another and there's absolutely nothing in between uh, you did this in relation to individualism and collectivism as well, although you didn't put it in those terms. Uh, but I did mention this before, that either someone is just completely selfish and self-obsessed and not bothering about other people at all, or they're completely absorbed into the collective and their whole identity, and there isn't anything uh, in between that at all and so this is a kind of technique of yours uh, that you pre present to opposite extremes that in reality nobody thinks like either of them and then you make out that you're solving some problem by uh, knocking this down uh, when you've invented the problem in the first place um, so so Lewis is trying to wean us away from that picture of God this is simply a big magnified version of us doing what we would do. Uh, so Lewis isn't doing a very good job of weaning you away from that idea, then is he? Because uh, you are God and what God wants is what you want and so on. Uh, so Lewis isn't doing a good job of weaning you away from that idea. So you say, for Lewis, God is more merciful, more overwhelmingly loving, more chaotically loving than we could ever imagine. Uh, so, I don't, chaotically loving, I'm gonna come on to that in a minute, but when you talk about love, you usually mean sex, so chaotically loving uh, is kind of having one night stands, isn't it? That You mean chaotically having sex, really, don't you? Not chaotically loving. Um, but I'm going to mention something about more about this presentation of God as chaotic in a minute, uh, because you do make another comment about it. So you then say, think of those great scenes in the Narnia books where Aslan releases people from the boredom, the drudgery of their lives, and leads them in a great dance of celebration. Uh, so you've presented Aslan as a Christ-like figure in these novels previously. Um, so your idea of what Christ does then is releases people from the boredom, the drudgery of their lives. 
Well, first of all, it's a great assumption um, to say uh, that people are experiencing boredom and drudgery. Certainly people are bored and experience drudgery in, at certain times in their lives, but is that their whole experience of life, which is what you seem to be implying? And also, Christ didn't die on the cross uh, to release people from boredom and drudgery, did he? Um, he died on the cross um, to... Um, save us from sin he paid the price of our sins by dying on the cross so he defeated sin by dying on the cross and then he defeated death by rising from the dead and these are two sides of the same thing uh, because it was sin that brought death into the world um, so you're talking about god being well aslan God being chaotically loving and then Aslan, who is a Christ-like figure, then a, a representation of God, releasing people from boredom and drudgery um, and leading them in a great dance of celebration. Then you say God is more anarchic and messy than anything we could imagine. Um, so anarchic is used generally to mean... Um, lawlessness it doesn't actually mean that anarchy it means um anarchy means no rulers um <laughs> whereas most people use it in the sense that it means no rules uh, but so i i think that's the sense in which you're using it so god is more lawless really than you're saying and messy than anything we could imagine uh, so God is chaotically loving and more anarchic and messy than anything we could imagine. Uh, so I'm just going to read now from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 14, verse 33. God is a God not of disorder, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Um, so you've presented God as just being all over the place almost confused not one thing or another um throwing all the rules aside and everything uh, this is how you're presenting god this is what you're like actually of course you're describing yourself <laughs> when you talk about uh, being chaotically loving you're talking about you um putting it about aren't you <laughs> and so you then say and at the same time, the hard message, hmm, the hard message is that God is someone who doesn't let us get away with anything less than the truth. Uh, well, that is true, actually. God doesn't really let people get away with anything less than the truth. Uh, but truth, I mean, God doesn't mean the same thing to you as the word God, I mean, doesn't mean the same thing to you as it means to other people, because when you talk about God, you're actually referring to yourself. Um, and truth doesn't mean the same thing to you as it means to other people either, uh, because words don't have any inherent meaning to you, do they? You just use them um, in the way that you want them to be, and you redefine them and you invent new words and so on. So truth to you uh, doesn't mean something which is inherently true, uh, which is a fact, which is the way things actually are. It means the way that you want things to be, the way that you've decided that they are. So that's what truth means to you. Um, so you say he's not merciful in the sense that he tells us, oh, forgive and forget. It doesn't matter. Uh, God sits with us as we actually come to terms with who we are and what we've made ourselves. Um, so this is true, really. Um, so you need to be thinking about this um, when you're telling people they can't leave the Church of England, even though they've got abusive bastards like you hounding them around the country and that kind of thing. Uh, so <laughs> you think you're the one who should be forgiving, don't you? Because I'm a terrible sinner to you because I didn't give you what you wanted and i won't go along with your agenda and i won't say that you're wonderful so this makes me the most evil person who's ever existed uh, according to your rule book uh, which is anyone who does what you want says what you want and gives you what you want is 
very holy and virtuous and anyone who doesn't give you what you want say what you want do where you want stay where you want is the most evil person who ever existed because this is how morality is decided in your world give you what you want and you're virtuous don't give you what you want and you're evil and there's no external system of morals or rules or anything like that um, so you then say so both in joy and in repentance lewis's god is one who is very different from the puppet the image we set up somehow we have to let god establish who he is not simply see him as a reflection of our own faces as a fulfiller of our own fantasies uh, so that's how you see god really um, as a reflection of your own face and a fulfiller of your own fantasies because you actually are god aren't you and you do everything you can to fulfill your fantasies and to force people to act out your fantasies and go along with them you'll go to extreme efforts um, to force people to fit in with your fantasies um, so this also where you talk about god being the image we set up i think this idea originated with durkheim actually who was a french sociologist um, and he came up with the idea uh, that god is in fact a projection of the the upper class in society i suppose um he would say i think he said something like that he was talking about the upper class the dominant people in society and god is um a projection um of their identity and their wishes and that kind of thing um so you're using it in a more individualistic sense um so you don't really believe <laughs> that god has any identity i'm going to mention that later on because you shoot yourself in your foot again in the next video i'm going to comment on um so god is very different from the puppet the image we set up so you're accusing other people of doing this whereas in fact it's what um you're doing yourself um and you say that we have to let god establish who he is well the point is that since christianity is a revealed religion we don't have to let god establish who he is because he's already established who he is and we've got the description of that and his action um, in history and salvation history we can read the bible uh, we've got the teaching of the church we've got the creeds which are uh, universally accepted statements of christian faith so god has already established who he is we don't have to wait for him to do that we can find out already um from listening to this teaching and from reading these documents um so we don't have to let god establish who he is because he's already done that anyway i shan't say any more for the moment because i'm going to comment on another video in a minute C.S. Lewis admired the writings of Thomas Merton, the American monk, and Merton, in one of his journals, comments that he's been reading a pious biography of some saint or bishop or other, who had said, I've never denied God a moment of my time. I hope he takes that into account. Merton's objecting to the idea that somehow God is in our debt. If we do the right things, God will do the right thing by us. God becomes somebody who obediently reflects our priorities and our agenda. And it's that notion of God as a kind of puppet, God as a kind of great magnified image of me and what I would like and what I would do, it's that sort of fiction that Lewis is also undermining in the Narnia stories. He helps us to see just how often we expect God to be like us. We think, what would I do if I were God? If I were all-powerful, if I were all-knowing, I'd do this, that, and the other, and I certainly wouldn't do this, that, and the other. Surely I wouldn't expose myself to suffering, to risk. Surely I would make the full demands of justice and not think about mercy, or alternatively, surely I would be merciful in all possible circumstances and let people off everything and tell them that they're actions and their decisions didn't really matter or didn't really have consequences. So Lewis is trying to wean us away 
from that picture of God that is simply a big magnified version of us doing what we would do. For Lewis, God is more merciful, more overwhelmingly loving, more chaotically loving than we could ever imagine. Think of those great scenes in the Narnia books where Aslan releases people from the boredom, the drudgery of their lives and leads them in a great dance of celebration. God is more anarchic and messy than anything we could imagine. And at the same time, the hard message is that God is also someone who doesn't let us get away with anything less than the truth. He's not merciful in a sense that tells us, oh, forgive and forget, it doesn't matter. God sits with us as we actually come to terms with the consequences of who we are and what we've made ourselves. So both in joy and in repentance, Lewis's God is one who's very different from the puppet, the image we set up. Somehow we have to let God establish who he is, not simply see him as a reflection of our own faces, as a fulfiller of our own fantasies. So I'm now going to make some brief comments about a couple of things that you said in another video. Um, and then this concludes my comments on the Narnia series, shall we say. Uh, so here's what you say. Let's try and imagine the Christian story in a completely unfamiliar setting. This is what you're saying that C.S. Lewis um, had the idea of doing it. Um, imagining the Christian story in a completely unfamiliar setting, in literally another world. Let's imagine Jesus, not just as a figure from a stained glass window or a Sunday school print. Uh, well, I don't know if this is what C.S. Lewis was thinking or whether it's what you um, are thinking, but uh, even without Narnia, we don't have to imagine Jesus just as a figure from a stained glass window or a Sunday school print, do we? Uh, because we've got the account of his life and teaching in the Gospels. Uh, so we don't have to imagine Jesus because we can just read about it. Um, so then you say, let's think of Jesus as a great wild animal governing this other world. This is what you're saying C.S. Lewis is saying. Let's get back to what it felt like to experience Christianity, not just as good news, but as good news something that nobody had ever thought of before uh, so this is where i think you're shooting yourself in the foot um here once again um so good news gospel means good news and the good news is that christ came and died on the cross for our sins and was raised from the dead and we can inherit eternal life so that's the good news in a nutshell and gospel means good news uh, so what you're saying is that we should experience Christianity not just as good news, but as good news. Uh, so it's a new thing. We experience it in a new way. This is what you're saying. Uh, something that nobody had ever thought of before. Uh, so this is how you view Christianity then, is it? Something that somebody thought of. Um, it's not something that happened like the life of Christ and him dying on the cross and being raised from the dead. You've slipped up here, haven't you, by saying something that nobody ever thought of before. So what you're saying is somebody thought of Christianity. It's not real. <laughs> That's a quite a funny belief for someone who claims he doesn't have to say the creeds with his fingers crossed behind his back. Right. <laughs> So, even if you were a centipede, you wouldn't have any feet left to shoot yourself in. <laughs> so anyway, later on in this video, you say, Lewis helps us to do this by saying, what if you'd never heard the story? What if this were as unfamiliar as it might have been to someone listening to the story of Jesus in the first century in some little town in the Mediterranean? It's a very bold, very ambitious thing to try. Lewis, I think, succeeds remarkably 
just by that stratagem of taking us into another world by showing us Jesus by another name with another face. And of course, to the end of the great to the end of the great series of stories, Aslan the Lion, King of Narnia, says to the children that he's been slowly getting used to him, to his presence. When you get back to your own world, you'll see me there in another form, as if all of this wonderful, elaborate, imaginative story about another world is simply to get us back to where we started, to our own world, and open our eyes here to the strangeness and the excitement of Jesus. Uh, so I think uh, you're referring to yourself here when you're talking about Jesus with another face. And when you talk about all this wonderful, elaborate, imaginative story about another world, um, you're talking about me, aren't you? Talking about saints in heaven. That's what you're referring to here. It's wonderful and elaborate and imaginative. Um, I'm just such a creative person. I just make things up out of nothing. <laughs> like the fact that you're a pervert. It's not based on all on things that you say over and over again, no. <laughs> it's not based on what I observe and what I experience. It's all wonderful, elaborate and imaginative. A story about another world. And all that that wonderful, elaborate, imaginative story about another world is about is simply to get me back to where I started. Oh, what, you mean the Church of England? To my own world and open my eyes here to the strangeness and the excitement of Jesus. Well, you identify yourself with Aslam. You identify yourself with Jesus. And you say uh, that Aslam, the King of Narnia, says to the children that he's been slowly getting used to him, to his presence. Uh, so that's what you've been doing. You've been slowly getting me used to you and to your presence. And then all this wonderful, elaborate and imaginative story <laughs> about another world. It's just going to get me back to where I started in the Church of England. And then I'm going to open my eyes to the strangement and excitement of Jesus, who of course is you. <laughs> You're as bad as a hatter. <laughs> You're a complete lunatic. Anyway, I'm going to talk about heresy now because uh, I did mention heresy a couple of videos ago where I was saying that uh, um, you were talking about God as being bigger than everything, which is kind of heretical because God doesn't occupy any space. He exists outside space. You said uh, that God is at the centre of the universe as well, whereas in fact God is separate from creation. Um, and uh, you were talking, oh yes, God being infinite or something like that. So you were on the edge of heresy there by um, kind of locating God within the temporal rather than within the eternal. Um, so, but luckily, it turns out that you've redefined heresy as well. Uh, so you're not a heretic, I'm a heretic, because it turns out that heresy no longer means uh, teaching unorthodox things, things that are against um, Christian doctrine or a, a perversion of it really because if somebody's teaching things that belong to another religion or that have nothing to do with Christianity then that isn't heresy it's just not Christian uh, whereas a heresy is something that kind of resembles Christianity uh, but is slightly different it's been perverted a bit so an example of that uh, would be um, in fact I've already showed a video where you were talking about Christ appearing to fail, Christ appearing to die on the cross. Um, so that's a heresy because Christian teaching is that Christ did die on the cross. Um, so if someone is saying that they're a Christian and saying that Christ only appeared to die on the cross, uh, then that's a heresy. Uh, so it's a perversion of Christian doctrine, really, a heresy rather than just being something entirely different, which would belong to another religion. Um, so, 
that's what a heresy is but you've re redefined it and i'm going to play a clip of you redefining it in a minute uh, but anyway, so I'm quoting from a, a talk that you gave in the Litchfield Diocese of the Church of England about heresy. And this was on the 6th of November 2010. And uh, what's particularly significant about this date is that it was only a few days after you received a letter from me uh, where I told you what I thought of you, basically, um, along with some other things. Um, and I have already read this letter out on YouTube, but one of the things that I said in this letter um, was that you were quite wealthy and that you'd become that way uh, by extorting money out of the Church of England by pretending to be a Christian and pretending um, to have the welfare of the world's Anglicans close to your heart. So that's what, what I said in that letter that you received um, only a couple of days uh, before you gave this lecture in the Litchfield Diocese in 2010. Um, so this is what you say. You do go on quite a lot more about heresy, but it's all in the same vein. Um, so I've just selected a short clip from it, um, but you don't say anything any different anywhere else. So uh, here's the clip. So what you say is, what stops the Lord's Supper being what it's meant to be is when people choose their company. <laughs> For St Paul then, the divisions he's talking about, the heresies, that's a Greek word that you use in there, um, which doesn't mean heresy. <laughs> Although the word heresy, if you trace it right back in its um, roots, it does go back to this Greek word. Uh, but that's not what uh, St Paul's talking about. The heresies are choosing the people you're comfortable with, choosing people like you rather than the people God has chosen. Uh, so this is another manifestation here of you being a cult leader um, and saying that people are not allowed to leave your cult. Um, so you go on to say, because the Lord's Supper is a celebration conducted by the people God has chosen. So you're really talking about the clergy here, aren't you? You're talking about priests in the Church of England, because in the Church of England, only priests celebrate the Eucharist. Uh, so when you're saying a celebration conducted by the people God has chosen, you're talking about yourself as being a person who God has chosen when quite obviously God doesn't choose Luciferians to be leaders of Christian communities. Uh, so you're making that up um, to tell your dissenters and people who leave the Church of England um, that they're heretics. <laughs> and it's not all your heterodox teaching that's heresy at all it's people who decide they've had enough and leave and i would also point out that just at this time in 2010 um pope benedict the 16th had announced the setting up of the anglican ordinaria so that um uh, well to facilitate groups of anglicans uh leaving the church of england and joining this ordinaria to in, a, in, a, in the catholic church so you're quite upset about that at the time as well in fact there's a video of you at a press conference about it when you're having a nervous breakdown <laughs> so uh, you're quite touchy about people leaving the church of england at this point in your life um, and i've just written you that letter a few days before um, and also, I did mention in that that I was going to uh, I was going to be a Catholic, and there was nothing that you could do about it. Um, so then, uh, so you say because the Lord's Supper is a celebration conducted by the people God has chosen, not anybody else. Um, so <laughs> you're chosen, and I'm not. That's what you're saying. So uh, elsewhere in this talk, apart that I'm not going to quote, you say that you're referring to St Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11. Uh, so I'm just going to read a couple of verses from chapter 11, verse 19 and verse 22. And it says, there have to be factions among you, for only so will it come to be clear among you 
who are genuine. Do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? Um, so that's kind of referring to you, isn't it, really? Because that's how you behave. Um, and you're saying that these factions are a bad thing and you say, no, St. Paul's saying this in an ironical sense, which you just invented. I'm not quoting this part of the uh, speech that you give, which is quite long. Uh, but that's what you say elsewhere in it. And you're saying Paul has been ironical when in fact he isn't at all. Um, but I'm going to put a little slideshow on uh, to demonstrate that you're just lying after I've finished this comment. Um, so you say, not a bad place to start really, because I think in the very earliest couple of centuries of Christianity, there was quite a strong sense that really was the essence of heresy. It was choosing something other than the full fellowship of believers. Uh, so I would just like to point out um, at this statement that choosing something other than the full fellowship of believers, well, it is actually you who is a member of a schismatic sect, isn't it? Not me. <laughs> so you then say, so in the second Christian century, when saints like Ignatius and Irenaeus write about heresy, they're not simply talking about slightly iffy ideas. They're talking about people who don't want to belong with the whole spectrum of the people God has chosen. They prefer to choose their company. Um, so that's basically what you've got to say about heresy. You've redefined it so that you can teach all this crap uh, that contradicts what the gospel says, that contradicts Christian doctrine. Uh, you say the Bible says the opposite of what it says quite often, and then you invent sayings of Jesus um, and all this kind of thing, which I've demonstrated over and over again. You're doing these things. But that's all right, because it's not you who's a heretic. It's the people who decide they can't put up with your bullshit and your satanic filth and your sexual perversions any longer and decide to leave and go somewhere else. They're the ones who are heretics, not you. Because you've got the authority to redefine words in English, haven't you? Uh, <laughs> this is just the extent of lunacy that you manifest. You're as mad as a hatter. you utterly deluded. Uh, you're rotten to the core. There isn't a grain of truth anywhere in your being. You're a complete and utter fraud. <laughs> anyway, I shan't say any more this evening because I've been talking for quite a long time and obviously I need to say a word about my beloved in a minute. Um, but I'm just going to play uh, these two clips from this, le this le uh, video about uh, Narnia uh, where you say that Christianity was thought of effectively rather than it was based on salvation history and events that happened in history. Um, that's what you're implying anyway. And then luckily though, that doesn't matter. You can say all this kind of thing because uh, people who don't want any more of your crap are the heretics rather than you uh, teaching all this false doctrine. So that's a relief. That'll be you off the hook on Judgment Day then, won't it? <laughs> right, so I'm going to say a word about my beloved in a minute. Well, Lewis goes one step further than Dorothy says. He says, let's try and imagine the Christian story in a completely unfamiliar setting in un literally another world. Let's imagine Jesus not just as a figure from a stained glass window or a Sunday school print. Let's think of Jesus as a great wild animal governing this other world. Let's try and get back to what it really felt like to experience Christianity, not just as good news, but as good news, something that nobody had ever thought of before. And Lewis helps us do this by saying, well, what if you never heard the story? What if this were as unfamiliar as it might have been to somebody listening to the story of Jesus in the first century in some little town in the Mediterranean? It's a very bold, very ambitious thing to try. Lewis, I think, succeeds remarkably just by that 
stratagem of taking us into another world by showing us Jesus by another name with another face. And of course, towards the end of the great series of stories, Aslan, the lion, the king of Narnia, says to the children that he's been slowly getting used to him, to his presence. When you get back to your own world, you'll see me there, you'll know me there in another form. As if all of this wonderful, elaborate, imaginative story about another world is simply to get us back to where we started, to our own world, and open our eyes here to the strangeness and the excitement of Jesus. What stops the Lord's Supper being what it's meant to be is when people choose their company. As he goes on to say, that of course, some people who are wealthy treat the Lord's Supper as an excuse to get yet another free meal. And some people go hungry. Some people elbow their way to the front in the queue, so to speak, and some people have their corns trodden on. Some people are privileged because of their social standing, and some who don't have the freedom, the wealth to offer hospitality at home, lose out. For St. Paul, though, the divisions he's talking about, the hierarchies, are choosing the people you are comfortable people of your own class, you might have said in other contexts, your own colour, choosing people like you rather than the people God has chosen. Because the Lord's Supper is a celebration conducted by the people God has chosen, not anybody else. Not a bad place to start, really, because I think in the very earliest couple of centuries of Christianity, there was quite a strong sense that that really was the essence of heresy. It was choosing something other than the full fellowship of believers. So in the second Christian century, when saints like Ignatius or Irenaeus write about heresy, they're not simply talking about slightly iffy ideas. They're talking about people who don't want to belong with the whole spectrum of the people God has chosen. They prefer to choose their company. At the very root of the word in Greek is that verb to choose. Hyrasis is choosing. It's what our word adhere comes from originally. Choosing your company, 